Well, hello, 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 everybody. We are in the Roxanne Lava Monday mission. And thanks again for joining us. Or if you're watching it later, I hope you'll find this kind of fun. Um, I am actually sharing <laughs> the stage this week with my friend, Catherine Byers, who is going to talk to us a little bit about one of her favorite passions in the world as a maker. And she's also going to talk a little bit about being a solo practitioner and why she decided not to be a solopreneur. So um, we've got the chat going. And if you'd like to put chat uh, questions in the chat, we'll try to answer them as we go. Um, and first of all, uh, and sorry, and then also we will take a few times throughout the show where we'll recap and also just kind of give you an opportunity to comment or ask questions. So welcome, Catherine. Well, thank you. Well, thank it's you. fun to be it's with fun you. To be with you. I'm um, glad to see you up in your studio. And um, here we are with, I just want to say to everybody, you're seeing me not in my studio because it's Catherine's turn at the studio. So <laughs> my studio and my crazy studio glasses are not on today. Catherine's going to take the wheel there. So um, Catherine, maybe you can first of all, just A, tell us what you are passionate about because I've only sort of... Um, teased the show with one image um, that you sent me, which are dyed felts. So maybe you can tell us. Yes, that's what, yes, 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 yes. So um, maybe uh, that gave everybody a hint that hopefully that we were talking about textiles. So maybe you can tell us why, um, or what it is about textiles that's, you know, you're so passionate about and that you enjoy working with. I think that um, for a lot of people who get involved in the fiber arts in any way, it may go back to their childhood. And for me, it definitely did. Um, I would spend summers with my grandmother in Vermont, and she taught me to knit at an early age. And so for all of my life, I have done some kind of craft. Um, I didn't get into spinning or weaving um, until I was much older, but I started out really loving the, the craft, the, meaning the detail and the expertise that the women in my family could produce. Uh, my mom was a person who knitted, crocheted, quilted, embroidered, you know, my mother made a, a a queen size cotton embroidery thread bedspread for my brother and my sister-in-law when they got married. And it took her literally years. Now, I'm a little more impatient than that. But as I got older, what really interests me are the is the process. Um, I really enjoy the process of seeing how something goes from in the example that I'm that I usually do, um, from a sheep's fleece through to uh, preparation and then on to a finished product, um, and and that was um, as I got older and I had a career and it was all fine, but I was still really interested just in. I love the the feel of the textiles, the weight of the textiles, the fiber that goes into the textiles, and combined with that ongoing uh, love of knitting and crocheting that I've had since I was a child. So I love that story, and I agree with you because, I, as you know, my textile history started with my mom teaching me to knit when I was three. And I love to knit and it's second nature to me. And it's also, um, I, I'm glad you also brought up the part about the text, the, the tactility of it, because I think that is another thing that's really interesting and perhaps something that as we continue to live more of our lives digitally, we want to go back to having that, that high touch kind of thing. Um, and I also think the process is is very interesting, but but also kind of the um, 
it's a very soothing thing to do. And in particular, now knitting and crochet is having quite a bit of a moment um, about helping people. Uh, we might have seen a lot of these spinner things for people to keep their hands active. Well, actually, knitting works the same way. Who knew with the brain? Yeah. Yeah. So these are all pretty interesting um, things. And um, they are, I think, something that we all kind of maybe share um, in our history. I also think it's just interesting to think about it from human history as well, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there is an inextricable tie between humans and textiles from generations. I, um, just, saw, I just saw something online yesterday that was um, when when a person makes yarn, they use a spindle or a spinning wheel. And when they begin, they spin the fiber in a certain direction. And then if they make a two ply or a four ply, they go in the opposite direction. And I saw that archeologists have found that the spinners in Egypt, like at the time of Cleopatra, spun in the opposite direction from the people in Rome. And just, <laughs> and I, I don't know what it means, but but it's sort of interesting that that historically there have just been ways of doing things, the way the materials they used, how they prepared them, all of that really interests me. Um, and when you talked about the tactile thing, I don't think you ever see a, a fiber person ever see something and and just hold it in their hand. They're always like picking at it, pulling it apart. You know that that this is just doing this is part of the process. Um, so I know that you're going to show us uh, some projects you've been working on. But before we do that, um, you have chosen very specifically not to be a solopreneur with this particular part of your life. And I was just wondering, because, um, you know, most of the time everybody's looking at what I'm doing, because whatever I need to do this week, because I had not need to be a solopreneur and I have to wear many hats. Um, but I thought it would be instructive for us to just have a conversation about being a solo practitioner versus a solopreneur. Mm hmm. I can, I can tell you a little bit about the beginning of it. Um, over 20 years ago, I was in a, in a career that um, had nothing to do with fiber, nothing to do with clothing, textile, anything. In fact, it was a technical writing company. But my boss had gotten into spinning and weaving, and she thought that I might like it too. And so we went off to an event that unfortunately will not be held this year uh, called the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. And boy, did I dive into the deep end. I came home with four live Angora rabbits that I raised and got their fiber, which you don't harm the animal. It really just, they sort of molted off. Um, and I was so um, infatuated with th this whole world of fiber that I thought maybe I could keep my full-time job, but have a sideline doing something different. And, and, and that something different was preparing fiber from the raw fiber, either the fleece sheared right off the sheep, plucked right off the rabbit, um, to prepare it for other spinners to use. Lots of spinners don't wanna do that work. They want to get something that looks like this and sit down at their spinning wheel or their spindle and go to work. But this actually is a blend of some wool and some silk. Um, and and I, I created what I'm holding in my hand. So I got that idea and at the time, it was feasible for me to buy some equipment, and um, and I did make a pretty big investment. Since you and I started talking about doing this today, I thought about about what I had spent just in the fiber preparation, and I think it was about three thousand dollars. Now, two thousand dollars. Is it okay if I move this around? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So. 
$2,000 of that went to this. And this is um, an electric drum carter that you feed fiber into and um, it passes through the drums. I'm having a hard time with the left right thing. And um, I'll turn it on for a second. Doesn't make a lot of noise. But as the fiber goes through, it, it aligns it and gets it ready for spinning. So this is sort of a, a Rolls Royce of uh, fiber, home fiber preparation equipment. Um, the man who made it is named Pat Green. He's no longer with us. Um, and when I need components for it today, like these belts over here, um, and I call to try to find them. The, the vendors always say, he was so quirky, he never made two of them exactly the same. <laughs> so you have to measure it out so they can send you new things. Now, sometimes, actually, I should have done it in a different order because this is my scariest piece of equipment. Let's see, I can't, but there we go. This is called a picker. And it really looks to me like medieval torture equipment. This is a bed of nails. Those are spikes. And if you have fiber, and I do have some right now that's making me cranky, um, that's very snarly, the, the, the nails, I'm not doing this right, the nails pick up the fiber and kind of literally tear it apart. So this was about $900. And then the last thing that I bought is a smaller version of the first thing I showed you. And that is, now I'm trying to get there. There is it. There it is. The drum carter, which this one is not electric, it cranks by hand. So I bought all those things. And um, and then I got some raw fleeces. We went to uh, a sheep and wool festival up in Massachusetts. And those run almost like an agricultural fair as well. So I bought the prize winning fleeces, thinking this was the good stuff, and brought it home and, and went to work and really enjoyed it. But it's very time consuming. And so what I very, I did this without creating a business plan. I just jumped in because I liked it, really. Um, and I very quickly realized that there was no money to be made. <laughs> there, there was lots of money to be spent, <laughs> but there was no, no money to be made. And so I, you know, put aside childish ideas or just enthusiastic ideas. And um, I've maintained using this equipment. I actually stopped using a lot of it for about 10 years when I came to work at Drexel teaching in the fashion design and merchandising department um, because I had such a long commute. I didn't, I just didn't have the time, but now I'm retired. Now there was COVID, we're all at home. And I got all this equipment out and have found kind of falling in love again, uh, working with it. And so right now I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is enjoying the process, um, trying some new things. Um, this weekend, I bought a little um, sampler of, of just an ounce of a bunch of different sheep fibers. Nice. That, so I can do kind of a fiber study. I actually see this as like a, a, a one person study group right now. Um, trying things that I haven't tried before. Um, the, this project that I had uh, sent you the picture of earlier is all uh, wool and silk, and it's dyed with uh, dyes that I found in my basement that I had bought years ago and didn't use. So this one, I've, um, I've got it dyed, and the next thing is to spin it. The only other thing I want to say about doing something like this, which is a little bit similar to being in business, owning your own business, or just having a job is 
I'm trying to plan out the projects I'm doing. Almost every day, I think of something else where I say, oh, wouldn't it be fun to do X? And so right now, I've got myself regimented to work on, I, I have three or four things going, so I don't get bored, um, but to work on those three or four, and when I complete one, then I'm allowed to start another. Um, so that's so how could, I'm, or, go ahead. I just wanted to ask you, so in, in you are focusing, not just on one thing, but on a small batch of things, right. so that you can continue to keep yourself from going crazy. And, you know, I always, I do that too, because I like to have several things going. So when one starts to stump me or frustrate me, I move on to the next <laughs> and that way. And a lot of times I find, and I think you might too, is that when you step away from it and you put your mind to other things, sort of the answer about that first frustration or problem may come to you. <laughs> yeah. which is which is really cool. And then I think the other thing that you're saying, which is something I really hadn't haven't really talked about on um, my Monday missions, is that through doing this, you're kind of keeping what I would refer to as like like a design journal. So you're kind of noting down also, I or maybe I should ask you, <laughs> are you noting down? Yes, that's from our good friend of. Uh, I can't think of her name right now. Yeah, the, the knitting with paper lady. Mo yes. uh Movina? No. Movana. Movana Chen, Mo right? Movana Chen. Yep. Yes. yes. And this is pretty recent, but I thought um I hadn't kept when I go back through the bins and bins of fiber and tools and yarns that I have, I think, where'd I get that? <laughs> and or I say, I know I bought an Icelandic fleece at the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. Where is it? I think I donated it actually to something. But um, but yes, I thought this is kind of it. I've been doing some different kinds of journaling since COVID happened. One of them is every day I take a walk or a hike and I take a picture of the place where I walked and hiked. Um, and I, I have a, a little WordPress blog that is just private to me, but it's where I post my pictures and, I, and, and I've enjoyed doing that and looking back over the year like, oh my God, look what that looked like last September. But I thought this would be a great way to, to document what I'm doing and whether something happens with it or not it remains to be seen. Um, so I just... Said the thing about getting stumped. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, you and I went to Scotland uh, almost two years ago. And when we came home, I was really interested in Harris Tweed. And you and I have done some work together with Harris Tweed. And I have a wonderful pair of slippers made from <laughs> Harris Tweed that you made. <laughs> but... I wanted, I, I haven't done a ton of weaving and I really wanted to, to try to, to mimic some of the things we had seen in Scotland. Oh, that's and, a big job. Well, <laughs> it, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm just thinking about the patterns. <laughs> it, well, it precisely. And the, and the yarns, because you know. And I didn't buy yarns there, but I went to, uh, there's actually... Uh, a town in New Hampshire called Harrisville and Harris Tweed comes from the Isle of Harris. And I bought some yarns that looked pretty similar. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but as time went on, you know, when you travel to a place, you get infatuated with whatever they're doing. And I just never quite, I looked at patterns. I, I actually today found a three by five card where I had mapped out a pattern for a Harris Tweed, a, a, a Tweedy print uh, design. And I realized I'm not a Tweedy person. <laughs> you know, like at the time it was, again, it was like, oh, I wanna see if I can do this. But just today, having let those yarns sit just on top of my loom, um, I came up with a new plan that doesn't look anything at all like a Harris Tweed, 
but incorporates those kinds of yarns on a loom. I'll do some twill the way they do. But I realized that with my house, if I was going to make pillows out of them or placemats or whatever it is, the Harris tweed was not what I wanted to do. And so it had to sit a long time before I came back. Now, again, right. I'm not in business, so I have that luxury. Well, so I want to just pick apart a couple of things from what you've said, because um, one of the things when you take your photo and do your little journal every day, I wanted to just share with everybody that there is a more regimented five minute journal that comes in a number of different ways, including apps. And um, it's just something that um, I did for about a year. This is well prior to COVID. And um, I would walk my dog every morning. Now, there are other parts of it. There's gratitude. There's some other things that you might write. So it's very structured in that way, which are less me. But the photograph was really me. And so what I love about that and what kind of I also like about you talking about leaving your materials out and also your um, drinking in everything from a, from a travel, you know, and really loving the whole part of it and really, um, you know, embracing it. But then as you allow it to sit with you, it becomes your own. And so, you know, there's inspiration, you know, there's documentation, there's um, sort of, I guess, assimilation, you know, and then there's taking all of those things and making it your own, which I think are really tremendous parts of design. And I think the part from inspiration to you one, one's personality, is really um, sometimes the hardest uh, thing, particularly when you have a business, because as you said, there may be a time constraint. And so a lot of times maybe you can't complete that process of making it your own. So you end up kind of mimicking something that came before. So instead of it being an inspiration, it becomes more of a um, a pattern. And what I also just wanted to tell everybody about that I thought was really funny about what you said about the Harris Tweed is, you might recall that the Harris Tweed that I bought for myself was a solid color with flecks of color in it from the, <laughs> from the fields of the Harris Tweed. It had no pattern in it at all. That's so, right. um, right. you know, it was, it is funny, but also very cool that, you know, one is able to have all of that experience to really, really enjoy something. And I think um, a lot of times we forget that part of the design process is just being a sponge and allowing everything to kind of come in and then letting it sort of bubble and finally come out. And um, prior to COVID, I think we had been going down a path where it was getting so crazy in terms of like industry that, you know, more and more faster, more faster, more faster, that we ended up having a lot less choice of things that were different. And right. that, that is one of the knocks on fast fashion. So just anybody out there who's a fast fashion person, I encourage you to um, just think about this, think about a fast fashion company and you know, you're gonna see that they have the same black t-shirt that the other fast fashion company. <laughs> <laughs> different label, maybe different, you know, made in a different country, maybe slightly different fiber content, but they have the same style black t-shirt as does yeah. everybody else. So um, it's just, those were just some things that I was thinking about in terms of that. And I think, um, that's an interesting story about making it your own. And I look forward to seeing what will be on the loom because Catherine's up in her upstairs studio, but her loom is mammoth. So it is down in her downstairs <laughs> living room. So um, it's a big, think, big, big people loom. People think I'm artsy when they walk in the door, you know? Well, it, it's a creative space. It actually works very well in your home as well. I mean, it's a nice, it, it does work in your home, unlike the plaid Harris tweet. So. <laughs> you 
know, it's funny when you come to that because um, while we were there and, and I really appreciate the, the inspiration from the countryside into the colors that they use. Um, on Instagram, I see something, I think it's the Harris Tweed Instagram, and they'll show a photograph of a place and yes. then they'll show the tweed that it inspired. And some, like some Harris tweed has hot pink in it. Yes. And I'm, I think, where the heck did we see hot pink? But then they'll show Heather, you know, yes. they'll show the flowers that actually can be pretty bright colors. You know, one other thing about that whole um, solopreneur and solo practitioner, um, I think about those weavers who yes. work in their homes or in a garden shed like the one we saw um, and who are, are definitely following, uh, they are not the creative uh, side of the business. They are the production side of the business. But talk about being on your own, you know, those, those folks, and I'm sure that they get some kind of support from Harris Tweed, but but that's their life. Go out in the backyard, go in the shed and sit at that loom for however many hours to get the job done is, you know, it's, it's a way of life that I think I, I, I would, I romanticize that I would like it, but I wouldn't. <laughs> well, and I, I totally agree with you um, in terms of it would not be much fun if you had to produce a certain amount of yardage in a certain amount of time. Um, and I think um, this is also a good point between solopreneur and solo um, practitioner. And the one thing that I think is really important is, is that, you know, doing something just for the love of doing it is great. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, you don't have to feel like you need to monetize everything in your life. <laughs> Sometimes no. it's better to just go get a job that you can leave at the job. That's right. That's and right. then you can pursue the things that you love. And sure, you might, you know, you might uh, want to sell some of it and people might want to buy some of it. And that's also lovely. But yeah. you don't necessarily have to make it your primary source of income, um, you know, in any way to feel legitimate about it. You should just feel legitimate that you love doing it and you are doing it. That's right. Um, and you and I have talked about the term that we really don't like for some reason is hobby. And it, it just, it seems like when you say to somebody it's a hobby, it, it does delegitimize it. And it shouldn't it because pursuing something that you love in your own free time is a very productive and constructive way <laughs> to spend your free time. I'm, a, I'm in a, a, a book club. And so there are lots of times when I probably should be reading the book for the next book club, but instead I'm you know, drum carding fiber or doing something else. And I have found that during, and this is a, this is maybe all the time, but more during COVID that I, for some reason, I like to be doing something. I don't, I'm not as into the passive things. I mean, reading is sort of in between, but, but I get fidgety and um, this, this has really been terrific. You know, um, one thing I had told you is I just participate in a Facebook group called Woolen Fiber Arts. And a lot of the people who are in uh, on that site um, are either farmers who are raising alpacas or sheep or goats or whatever it is. And pre-COVID had a business doing this. So during this time, when they've been isolated, um, one one cool thing about the the group is they run a monthly sale. And some of the people say that monthly sale is the only thing that has kept them in business. And, uh, you know, you and I, I've joked about it, that some of them are really professional and they come on in their half hour slot and they've got a costume on or they have a theme and they're, you know, everything is lined up perfectly. And then as we were joking before, there are the people who are you know, sort of leaning into the computer and fumbling around. But nevertheless, um, 
they have gone from being people who might have a yarn store or any of those the related um, businesses and haven't been able to to make a dollar and now you know this and i'm sure there are other avenues for doing you know etsy i had no idea you could buy sheep fleece right off the sheep mm -hmm. on etsy well you can um and and there's a lot of that kind of thing going on i think that um etsy has like their business during and i know this because they're a client of my daughter's at google um their, their business has like exponentially grown yep. during COVID as people either take on home craft, get the supplies there, whatever it is. I mean, it's been an extraordinary year from so many perspectives, but to me, some of the good stuff is, and you touched on this earlier, is we're home, let's do something good with that time, you know, and something that you can really sink your teeth into yes i totally agree and i think it is great um uh, uh, you know what you bring about is that you know people have been challenged to find new paths to purchase for consumers and so that i think is really true um the other thing though that i think is interesting and i think i might have talked a little bit about this before the whole reason that I started the Roxanne Lava Monday mission is because what I have really noticed through social media and through um, Etsy is a is a platform that is also difficult for this. Um, it's very hard as a maker to scream above hundreds of thousands of makers and to be heard or watched or shown, and. I think this makes it, it, it is a huge challenge. And, you know, on my business side, I have a lot of thoughts about this. But one of the reasons that I decided to do the Monday mission is because I really love the making. I, it's not that I don't like the, the photo shoots and stuff. I do, actually. I love the photo shoots, too, because they're just as creative. And my photo shoots are pretty. I mean, I'm always happy with my photo shoots, whether other people like them, that's on them. Um, but. <laughs> It is very hard, or well, it's their choice, but it's very difficult to, um, part of it's because you're a solo person, right? If you have somebody who can be your brand voice and has all the time in the world to just push your social media, then I guess that's fine. But when that's only one of the things that you do, it's very hard to create enough media to scream above the thousands of other people. So one of the mm -hmm. things that I noticed on Instagram, which is my primary source of social media, is that, and I really did watch this, it seems like the only people following you are your friends and the people you follow who follow you back. It's very hard to get new follows. Very, very hard to get new follows. And it's also very hard to um, find things on Etsy in many categories because there's just thousands of them. So until somebody curates it for you, it's very difficult to, you know, to actually find those things. So from the solopreneur point of view, it's very difficult now to do this. So one of the reasons I started all of this is just because I like making shoes. I like making all kinds of things. So it's not just shoes. It's just that I happen to have a shoe business. And I also right. love business. I love all of it. So for me, that's why I decided I would talk about this on Mondays, whether people are interested in it or not. It makes another documentation for me of my business and my world if nobody else is interested. But at the end of the day, it's really this solo thing is also hard because there's only you and you only have so much time and pushing creativity across design, production, marketing, you know, it, it it's that's asking a lot of one person in today's world. So I'm with you. I kind of love I always romanticize like that Harris Tweed kind of thing. 
you know, and of course the Harris Tweed Authority is doing all the marketing and there is room for um, like Rebecca, the woman mm -hmm. we saw, she did pieces for the Harris Tweed based on Harris Tweed, but she also was allowed to do her own designs, which she was also allowed to sell as Harris Tweed. So that kind of yeah. person I might be able to be. Um, but much as I loved the Isle of Harris and will be going back someday, um, it would be a small place for me <laughs> to live. I don't think I could, I could never yeah. live there. I, I, I also romanticize yeah. the fact that I could live there. It just wouldn't, I, I, I know that I would lose my mind, but you I, know. I think it would be great to have like two months there. Yep. Have a cottage someplace yep. like Luskin Tire yep. and, you know, travel around and, and uh, visit other weavers and and you know do all those wonderful hikes and yeah it it was magical um but when you get down you know i think a lot of people they go on vacation someplace and say oh i'm gonna live here and then, and then they wake up yes know? yes like, I, I completely agree I, i'm not brave enough to even drive there so. <laughs> Well, and you'd have to there because there's not a lot in terms of buses to get you around. Um, so Catherine, I did also want to know, do you have anything, anything planned that you'd like to show us in terms of process or any of the projects that you're working on that you'd like to talk about? Well, I can talk about a couple of things. Um, one is this big bowl of colored fiber um, that I, that I, I got out. And um, so this started as a, one of those bags of fiber I found in a bin. And it was uh, a combination of wool and silk. And this was, the, here's a good reason to keep a journal. I don't know how much wool. I don't know how much silk. I don't know what kind of wool, although I'm guessing it's merino because it's pretty fine and soft. Um, and it was kind of um, tangled. It wasn't, it wasn't, certainly wasn't ready to spin. And, and at the same time, serendipitously, I found all these gay wool dyes and gay wool, interesting, they're from Australia, actually. Um, but you have to do very little, all you have to do to dye wool with gay wool dyes is soak your fiber ahead of time, get it thoroughly wet. Other ones, you need to add some other chemical. I mean, sometimes it's like vinegar, like you dye yes. Easter eggs. But with this, you don't have to do anything. Um, I have a separate set of pots that I use only for dyeing because the chemicals are really good for you. Um, I wear a mask in my own house when, <laughs> when I'm dying. Um, and I decided to try... Uh, just to see what, what would come out. I didn't know if the dyes would be good anymore or not. So I think I did six or seven different colors. Um, this is kind of like a red plum, a navy blue, this green. And um, I was pretty happy with what was coming out after. And I dyed the tangled up stuff. And then I used that electric drum carter that I showed before, and I drum carted these. And each one of these, this is called a bat with a drum carter. The funny thing is, it, it looks like I have a lot of fiber here. Probably doesn't even weigh a whole ounce. It maybe weighs one ounce. It's very light. It's very soft and fluffy, and it's one of those things where you just love to play with it. Catherine, sure. can I just interrupt you just for one second? Because there may sure. be people who are not fiber people, you know, watching. And yeah. what I was just wondering is, could you just tell somebody, like, if you were just to make a sweater for yourself, how much, mm -hmm. how many ounces of wool would you need to do that? Well, the answer, there, there isn't one answer, the, but the answer includes, um, how thick or thin the yarn is, how um, how complicated the pattern is. Yes. You know, there are, are very simple, you know, almost like a kimono style thing that you could make. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think many of the, I, 
of the patterns that are say uh, sort of an average woman's size sweater you probably need i would say you probably need a, almost a pound maybe not quite that but maybe three quarters of a, of a pound um and and again it, it's the yardage that really matters so um I have I have a different kind of loom that you haven't seen because I don't have it set up called a triangle loom, and it looks like a big easel, but it has a a, a long six foot beam that goes across the top and then two sides that come down like this, and I remember that when I bought it, the 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 maker said you can make a good size shawl with seven hundred yards. Now that's a lot. That's a lot. When you're spinning. Yes. When, hang on, hang on a second. <laughs> I was going to say that's a lot of time spinning. That's a lot of time spinning. This is a skein of yarn um, that I'm, I'm working on another part of today. This is one of the projects that I have to finish before I do something else. And this skein of yarn is 150 yards. I measure it as I as I finish it, and I won't go into the technicality of what I'm doing. But um, so that's 150 yards. So I would probably need, you know, what four, five, six of these to to end up with a garment. I think that what this is going to become actually is a bunch of um, cowls, just yep. knitted cowls, simple knitted cowls, because this is probably uh about a worsted weight which is uh a, not a heavy not a bulky yarn but not certainly not a fine yarn um mm -hmm. and the reason i think it's going to become a, bu a bunch of cows is i hope to be in germany for christmas this year and there are a number of people i need to bring gifts and so i thought oh this <laughs> This and cow, and and a lot of times I start out. I don't know what my project is. I kind of let the yarn dictate it. Project, um, I think would 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 be nice. And it's the kind of thing that if I do want to sit around watching TV, I can I can still be doing something, which I've I've always done as well. So anyway, this. This whole big bowl of yarn, and this is this isn't all of it. This is just a little of it in the various colors. I actually think when I spin it all, it probably will make um, either like a fair isle cowl or mm -hmm. a fair isle hat. It won't make the, like there's. I didn't. I don't have enough of this to make a sweater. Right. If I if I wanted to use it, I could do something where there's a pattern in the yoke. And then the rest mm -hmm. of the sweater is solid color. Uh, that's kind of not me either. But 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 I think it's I want to do something that involves color work to it to do to explore the interplay of these colors. Socks. Make socks. Oh, I should have brought them up. I have two really cool pairs of socks that are <laughs> I wear them. I have made socks. Um, homemade socks, you have to use a yarn that's got a little nylon in it so that they don't wear through quickly. Um, but I have two great pairs of socks. There's a kind of a sheep called a Jacob. And a Jacob sheep has many colors on the same sheep, from white to sort of a, a grayish brown to a really dark chocolatey brown. And I made a pair of socks that I wear more like slippers sometimes. In, when it's really cold, I'll wear them around the house because they come up mid-calf. Um, but they look like um, like a Norwegian knit, a pattern knit that is multicolored, but it's all from the same sheet. That was That's an old experiment. When I first started saying, gee, let's see what I could do with this. Um, but yeah, socks are great. Mittens are great. You know, I, I also do like small projects because some of the spinning takes so long that when you, you want something that's going to give you some gratification pretty quickly. Um, 
right now I'm using up a whole bunch of hand spun yarns making seven children's hats because right now I have six grandchildren and later this year if everything goes well I'll have seven and I'm making hats for everybody for next Christmas. So, and it's one time I'm really planning ahead so I'm not knitting on the plane on my way to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that too. <laughs> But, well, it's um, interesting. I was just going to say it's also interesting because one of the great things that you can always do when you knit is it doesn't matter what it is you make. You can always just put it into the gift box. And then when people have events or you need a gift quickly, if you knit a variety of different things, you often will have something that, you know, you can just find for that person that will be great. Yeah, exactly. Um, I can show you one other thing um, while we're still doing this. And I, I picked up a handful of this fiber before. Yes. And this is this is from what's called a border lester sheet. Um, it's not super fine uh, fiber. And one of the interesting things about all these different sheep is some of them produce very fine, soft, um, yarns. Some of them are very coarse, like a Navajo sheep um, produces like a rug yarn from its fleece. This is a, toward the finer side, but this is fleece off the, off the sheep. It's been washed and I'm in the process of, of using the hand drum carter that I showed you originally to prepare the fiber to spin. And I do have, I have one spinning wheel up here, but I have another one down next to the loom that's a bigger one. And with this one, I'm trying to spin really fine. The, the blue yarn I showed you before, this is, you know, bordering on chunky. It's not chunky, mm -hmm. but it's bordering on it. But just as an, as an exercise, I'm trying to see how fine I can spin this. I don't really know what the project it's gonna be, is gonna be yet. But I have miles to go before I sleep with this. I still have it. most of the, no, but maybe half the fleece is downstairs wrapped in a sheet. It turned out, and even as I'm talking to you, I don't know what's wrong with this sheet, but it must have rolled in the dust every day of its life. <laughs> because I'm just sitting here and the little computer table in front of me now has grit on it. So this, I've, I've cleaned it I've, a, a couple of times. I'm carding it, and each time more the grit falls out, and when I find yarn, I'll wash it again. So this is sort of the, the really early state. You know, this is from, from, what do they call it, sheep to shawl um, kind of project. It starts at the very beginning, and someday it'll come, it'll come to something. Catherine, I just... I just wanted to interject because you brought a really good point up and I talk about it all the time because, you know, I use leather and leather is skin and some skin is in great shape and some skin is not in great shape. And, you know, who knows why, but a number of things could be um, from, you know, just natural DNA accidents, whatever, with any of these things. And I think it's really an interesting thing for people to think about when you use natural raw materials that, you know, there are, are all kinds of grades of them. There's the very perfect and there's the very imperfect. And so, you know, one of my things, as you well know, is that we should embrace the imperfect as well as the perfect because everybody wants the perfect. And the more we can embrace the imperfect, you know, the better off we are in terms of sustainable and using resources and, and those kinds of things. And, you know, I often love celebrating the imperfect. So um, your border sheep is a little, your border Lester was a little imperfect, perhaps a little dirty like pig pen, <laughs> but in the end, <laughs> won't it be interesting to see what that imperfect um, you know, raw material can lead to in the end. And this would also be true of cotton, linen, silk, you know, sil raw silk is quite different from processed silk. Um, Absolutely. So these are all things that are really 
interesting. I mean, if you are working at all with any kind of natural raw material, each one of those, there's infinite possibilities with each one. And, you know, you're also, um, your border Lester may not combine well with anybody else. I mean, who knows? That's right. So, you know, That's this right. is another, you, you know, sort of component of working with natural elements as well. One of the things that, um, so, so this weekend when this sale on the fiber arts page was going on, I always say, I'm not buying anything. And then, <laughs> and then, and then, so <laughs> there actually was a woman selling a yak silk blend um, ready to be spun, right. already dyed. But some of the colors looked a lot like the colors of this wool silk that I'm doing. And, and, I, and so I bought some. Um, and what I have to check when it arrives, when you said certain things will or won't combine in it, when you're working with fibers like this, the length of the individual fiber matters. Sometimes if you try to combine something really short with something longer, you're going to be frustrated. You're going to be frustrated. And, and yes, there are ways to always make it work. But I often wonder if you do something like that five years from now, will that yarn or that knitted piece hold up well because you've combined things that maybe weren't quite ready to be combined. So I'm waiting for this um, yak silk blend to show up to see how long that they call it the staple, you know, how long each, like this is pretty long from this sheep. And um, see, this is what's wrong with this sheep. That should be two locks. And do you see how I tear it apart? That's why, that's why I'm putting it through the medieval torture device with the nails. Um, because it pulls out a lot of these snarls, but but there are things that are one of the things that that I've heard people say a couple times too is garbage in, garbage out. You know the quality of the material, even if it's not the prettiest one, it it does matter. It does matter. Yeah, well, and I think you're right because the interesting part of of, again, of all these imperfections is, is that some may just in the end have a particular aesthetic mm -hmm. uh, outlook, but the structure is sound. Mm -hmm. Some may result in a poorly structured finished product. And then, as you say, that's the garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So, you know, it, I think these are really interesting things to kind of consider as we, um, think about using natural materials because it's also something, and you know, I like this, but there are people who are makers who wouldn't like this. I love the fact that that's something you don't control. <laughs> so, right. you know, you have to learn to work with it as opposed to making it do your bidding. Whereas, yep. you know, when we concoct a, a, a man-made fiber, we can go to DuPont and say, I'd like this much and this much to make this thing. And we have a chemical thing that we can reproduce all the time. And we know that it will always be the same every time we do it. So, you know, yep. that's a very different kind of um, way of approaching making than using the natural and raw materials. One thing that I've been happy to see, and again, it's maybe thanks to COVID and these online sales, is how many small fiber production places there are in this country. I'm, I, you know, I know of um, a few, and I've actually sent fleeces out before when I just knew I had too much and I, I just wanted to get back the stuff ready to spin. I know of a few of the main ones, but there are uh, dozens, hundreds, I don't even know, of these small fiber processing mills all around the country. Um, and and that's to me, is kind of heartening to see that there are people who really value, just like those Harris Tweed people, yep. value the 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 old fashioned way and they may be using you know mechanized mm -hmm. um 
machinery to 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 do whatever they're going to do with the fleeces but it's it to me it's just terrific i mean th there's one in alaska there's a bunch in ohio michigan uh there's a lady raising icelandic sheep in montana so that's kind of fun and and the exploration of that is also interesting to me so catherine you know, i'm gonna i'm gonna send you off because we're getting kind of towards the end but here i have a new project are. For you, your new project needs to be to compile a list and categorize all those people into one big <laughs> space, either a website or a, you know catalog or something, so that we could all use them. And the second thing I'm going to say is, yeah, if they're using modern day machinery, good on them. Because if Michelangelo had a, um, if he had had a computer and if he had lived a little longer, he might have actually invented it. He would have used it. So, so you know, that's right. It's not it's that's right. These things are only a tool. Your drum, your electric drum carter, is not any different in what it does from your hand carter. Yeah, it just has and electricity and moves a lot faster. It's just it's just kind of a modern version. Exactly. Of well, and your your torture <laughs> chamber is definitely a modern version of that. <laughs> I knew you'd like that. Oh, I love those. You know me. Well, this has been it has it's, Catherine. This has been terrific. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks for it so much for sharing every with it, everything with it. Um be, with us rather. Um it's so nice and it's refreshing to talk to another solo practitioner. And again, I think this is one thing that if you are watching, you can take away from us as solo practitioner, solopreneur, whatever you want to call yourself. When you are solo, it's also so important to have a network of other people who, even if it's not your particular discipline, share your love of making something because you can all get together and just talk about that and you have another rich sort of network of people to kind of interact with. So thanks Absolutely. so much for sharing your Thank story. Thank you. And Neil thanks really for has me. enjoyed it. So um, I think that this is uh, was a winner. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. <laughs> so um, I'll say goodbye. And everybody, I hope you enjoy the session. And um, I'll see you next week with another Monday mission. I have been doing a lot this week already. Um, so I'll share some of my story on Instagram of what I've been doing just creatively, because you might like to see it, a few new processes. And um, Catherine's out there on Facebook and Instagram as well. So thanks so much, Catherine. And we'll talk soon. Bye, everybody. <laughs>